Welcome. Thanks for tuning in today. If this is your first time, we want to say a special welcome to you and say thanks for checking us out. And we would invite you to click on the digital connection card up above or leave a comment in the chat about who you are and how we could pray for you. And if there's a question you might have, again, we're so glad you are here and certainly hope it's not your last time. So let us know how to be helpful. And if this is your spiritual home, we say welcome to you and we're grateful too for your continued faithfulness of being part of our online experience. This is the third Sunday of Easter, and we are grateful for this season, right, as the springtime comes. I want to share, I had an opportunity uh, this week to visit with our friends at Heartfelt Radio, uh, just leaning into a conversation. There's a link here in the worship notes, just talking about how do we just deal with this crazy season? Just if you think about the last week, of all the things that have just happened, uh, the shootings and just all the tension. And so spent some time with Mark and Gabe looking at Psalm 16 and a few other things, just trying to put in perspective. I'm just wondering, you know, did, have we really learned anything from having experienced the global pandemic? The things that we should be thinking about and really the idea fundamentally is connecting with God in a much deeper way. Uh, of realizing that uh, politics isn't our answer and economics is not our answer, but really Jesus is our answer. And so just hope you'll find some encouragement in our conversation there uh, from Friday morning. And then I also want to share that Matt Skolnick and I and a number of others from our presbytery made a road trip to the south side of Columbus. We visited with a ministry called the Community Development for All People. It's run by the United Methodist Church. But we wanted to just kick the tires and get a sense of how they're doing community missions in a whole new way. They have a church, but they also have a nonprofit. What's crazy is they own and operate $150 million worth of real estate for helping people with subsidized housing. This is such a beautiful thing. They have a bike shop, which really got my interest, uh, how they uh, offer bikes for people who need transportation. They bought an old drive through across the street that uh, is now a a fresh produce market and each day they encourage people to start there before they do their regular shopping to find out what they've got and as we walk through you can see but check out this video such an amazing working of the kingdom there in so many different ways. Really enjoyed stopping at the South End Cafe that just opened up actually on March 30th. What they're going to be doing there is working with people for a second chance, those that have been incarcerated, to get them a job and teach them a skill and 
give them some real purpose in a whole new way. We visited there just to sort of prime the pump to think about in this next season of life. Uh, how do we meet the needs of those around us, the least of these, if you will? And so as we come to worship today, let's begin with some scripture.
We are in week three of our series called Got Thou. And we're just leaning into a deeper conversation because I think in so many different ways, even as I sat and talked with Mark and Gabe about just the things that have been going on, things that just continue to unsettle us, and then wrestle through just where do we find ourselves and really wondering what, what God is doing and what he's allowing and just really what's the next thing coming uh, that we ought to be prepared for. I do know that many people find themselves doubting God, and I totally get that. And to be honest, in my own story, there are moments where I have to confess I've doubted God uh, on an occasional basis. But I think more often it isn't that I'm doubting God as much as I'm doubting myself and his call upon my life. Because I know when I think about myself, it's the me that you don't see that really is what I wrestle through. See, I know the voice that's in my head, and I'm glad that no one can hear that voice because sometimes it isn't the best. It brings about a sense of insecurity, and it brings about all sorts of critical thoughts. And there's times where I really wrestle. There's times when I I don't like who I am. And I think it's just being real and being human. And sometimes it's this simple thing where I don't like uh, what I said, Uh, But then other times it's like I don't like how I said it or what I did or maybe even what I didn't do. And then what's sobering in these moments and probably is the worst of all is that I know that God, he knows all my faults. And yet what I also know is that he loves me and he sent Jesus to die for me as he did for you. At the same time, I think if we're honest, we all wrestle with how can he, I can't even imagine how he can really use me for the kingdom with all my brokenness and all my uncertainties and all my insecurities. So what I want to talk about this week is when we feel insecure or when we feel inadequate or when we feel insufficient. Because I think it's in those moments of insecurity that we begin to doubt who God is and who we are. Because we know that God specializes in using people who know that they are broken. God specializes in using people who think there isn't much they have to offer. Because the beauty of what he brings us through the Holy Spirit is his presence and his power that he equips us with to do his purpose. And yet, when we think about our insecurities, it's the thing that limits our ability to make a difference. The truth is, most of us, if we're honest, and would be willing to talk with some sense of vulnerability, we will talk about our insecurity and our inadequacies. If God wants something done, why would he use me? In fact, the scripture is filled with stories of men and women. There's got to be somebody way better than me uh, or way better than them to, to lead and to do and to, to bring the kingdom in such amazing ways. Now, because when we think about it, we think about our own limitations, right? Uh, well, maybe you don't know a lot about the Bible. Uh, maybe it's because you don't feel like you can share your faith. Or maybe it's that you don't feel comfortable praying out loud, uh, much less being invited to lead a small group, if you would be. But, you know, if we're honest, and I have to confess, we talk about the YouVersion app here all the time, right? And I do use the YouVersion app daily as much as I can. But I have to share that uh, I don't get to read the Bible every day like I would like to. In fact, this year it seems like I've struggled more than any other year. This is my sixth time through the Bible in a year plan with Nikki Gumbel, who's the head of Alpha. It's a Bible reading plan here on YouVersion. I've really struggled with just being able to do it consistently. Now, I haven't missed out on the daily verse because I don't want to lose my streak, but I tell you, even this morning, uh, I had to catch up. I was three days behind on my Bible in a year. And so also when I think about just how I conduct myself, how I do life. There are times when maybe my words aren't the best that they could be, aren't the most affirming, aren't maybe even there's a cuss word there sometimes. There's moments when I lose my temper. I mean, these kinds of things can can steal our joy and can steal our focus and can create a sense of insecurity in who we are and what we're trying to do uh, each day as we live into our vocation and our calling. And then when you think about it, we know what we've done wrong, right? We know our our brokenness. We know the sins we've committed. We also know those that we've hurt uh, and how we've fallen so short of what uh, God's standard can be. 
And when I think about those things, and I'm going to guess if you're honest and you think about them too, you think about what you've done, you could probably ask the question, you know, why would God use me? Well, I want to start first as sort of a foundational understanding is that, that God knew exactly what he was doing when he made you and when he made me. In fact, I remember a bumper sticker a number of years ago that I saw that said, God, don't make no junk. Uh, that idea that he, he only makes things that are amazing. And yet, when we think about our own stories and the brokenness that we're walking in and through, sometimes we don't see that in a, in a sense of truth. Now, remember, the Apostle Paul said this about who we are in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. We are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. That's chapter 2, verse 10 of Ephesians. Think about that. Think about that. What are you? You are God's workmanship. Even more importantly, he says that you are God's masterpiece. Now, that word masterpiece, a little Greek for you today, is the word poiema. And it, what it does it mean? It means a creation with a designated purpose, workmanship, and masterpiece. If you will, poetry. Think about that. You are God's poetic statement. You are beautiful. You are valuable. You are even, if you would say, custom designed, maybe even tailor-made by the master's hand. That has to be a sobering and a, and a centering kind of understanding, which means what? That God gave you the right personality. He gave you the right gifts, even the right mindset, even the right temperament. And even think about this, that you were born at the right time. To what? To do the good works. To do the good works that he planned before you were born for you to do. Just think about that for a moment. Now, the reality is, right, is that we have, as we've talked many times, there is an adversary, a villain, if you will, that comes into our story that wants to steal, crush, and destroy, right? John 10, 10. But we know, too, that Jesus said he's come to give us the most amazing life if we'll trust him. And so it's the evil one who comes and says through whispers and through insecurities and through uncertainties, he says, God can't use you. He says, God can't use you. You're just a mess. Well, the truth is we need to, with boldness, thinking about who we are as the sons and daughters of the great king, is to say, I was a mess, but now I'm God's masterpiece, to claim that truth to be true. So let me ask this question today. Who does God most often use? Well, when we look at Scripture and we look at it carefully, there's three different kinds of people that God taps, if you will, or chooses to do his will. The first is God uses the unlikely. The story out of the Old Testament, you may remember God was talking to the prophet Samuel and they were getting ready to find the next king of Israel. And in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 6, he says, When they arrived, Samuel saw Elab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. That's 1 Samuel chapter 16, verses 6 through 7. This is an incredible statement here. And I just love this because God is looking for the qualities people overlook, right? So it's interesting in this particular story, one by one, Samuel's looking at those that were called the qualified candidates, those would, that seemed to be the ones that God would be choosing. And he's about ready to give up. And he has a conversation with uh, Jesse, the, the father that he's talking to. And Jesse says, oh, you know, there is one more, but he's the youngest. You wouldn't want him. He's, in fact, he's out in the back 40 because he's a shepherd today. So he's working with the sheep. And what's beautiful here is that even though David was the youngest and probably the least likely, God said, that's the one I choose. Which helps us to just embrace this idea as we think about this, the unlikely, that God loves to use those who are overlooked by others. Now, I don't know about you, but uh, if you've ever felt overlooked, like God 
wouldn't use you, there's all sorts of people I could point you to, the people that I've met. In fact, even Wednesday as we were in Columbus, uh, one of the ministries that uh, All People offers is a bike shop and had a chance to meet uh, a couple of the people who worked there. But one person in particular stood out was a woman. Uh, she's retired, and her name is Nancy. And you can see here she was working on this, this small bike for a child. And she said, well, I, I can't do bikesmith stuff. I can't do a lot of the adjustments. But I watched her pull out a wrench and, and tighten up the handlebars, and I watched her adjust the seat. And I watched her wipe down the bike, and I watched her uh, put some air in the tires. So... Yeah, she wasn't a bikesmith, but she was putting some real love and care into this bike that I know will be a blessing to a child that will find it. And as we talked, uh, one of the programs we shared that uh, they are doing there in Columbus that we actually do here in Mansfield is working with the local police department to take old bikes and reclaim them and restore them. And there's a number of ministries here in our community that then gives them to people who are in need. Uh, and it's a beautiful way of sharing just the hope and encouragement with a gift. Or there's other people that I met, mentioned last week. Our friend Johnny English, who had spent some 32 years in prison. And Johnny, uh, in fact, came to faith in his 12th year in prison and was in prison for another 20 years before he finally got out. And how the beauty of what God's using him now in such an incredible way. Even this week I was listening to a podcast. It's probably the most popular podcast right now by a former NFL player, a very successful businessman, Lewis Howe. And it was interesting just hearing his own story about just the mindset that he had coming to life, that even as a a young child, he was sexually abused and never thought he would amount to much. He ended up spending almost every weekend visiting his older brother who was in prison. And then his parents got a divorce. And you wouldn't think that life would turn well for him, but he leaned in and and became a successful athlete. And it was just interesting. He said it wasn't until he was a little bit older that he was able to best understand how God could use him and how his brokenness led him to a place of really changing the world. And he's had some 1,400 conversations on his podcast with amazing men and women all over the world about understanding what it means to to be all that God desires you to be. Really an encouragement. So not only does God love those who are overlooked by others, but he also specializes in using the unlikely to accomplish the impossible. So I want to begin, too, with as a word of encouragement is to say, stop believing what others say about you and believe what God says about you. So this idea of who God specializes in, well, first of all, he uses the unlikely, but then he also uses the insecure. Now, another story from Scripture. You may remember in the book of Judges, the Israelites have sinned, and they're under God's judgment. And God gave them over into, a, into the hands of the enemy, the, the evil Midianites. And there was a guy that we meet here by the name of Gideon. And one of the things we know about Gideon, he was totally insecure. He was afraid, and he was actually in hiding when we meet him. And an angel of the Lord shows up and says to him, The Lord is with you, Gideon. You are a mighty warrior. God has chosen you to rescue Israel from the Midianites. Well, you would think Gideon would be like, Oh, cool. Well, if an angel of the Lord shows up and tells me I'm good, then I'm good. Well, that's exactly not what he did. In fact, his insecurities shouted louder than God's affirmation. Here in Judges chapter 6, verse 15, it says, But Lord, Gideon replied, How can I rescue Israel? My clan is the weakest in the whole tribe of Manasseh, and I am the least in my entire family. Well, here's the bottom line when we see these things. that God is going to, he's going to call you, and he's going to stir you, and he's going to move you to do something. And, and so what we need to see, whether it's here in the church or it's in your community, that there's a place where we're going to be invited to share our faith, to be able to share our witness and our testimony at work or at school. But what? We're going to say, but Lord, right? And we're going to tell him why we're not the best person. I got to tell you, even in my own story, I can remember as I enrolled in seminary, I can remember even before that, long before that, somebody asked me recently when I uh, got my first call to ministry. And I have to be honest that I wrestled with it when I was a a young teen. But I, I wrestled through my inadequacies and my insecurities thinking there's just no way I could do that. And then even when I got to seminary, It took me nine years as I was pursuing other work 
at the same time. But in that nine years, I intentionally avoided the teaching and the preaching because I didn't think I really had anything to offer. I intentionally took the classes that would help me be a better leader, but there was no way I was going to preach. And yet it, I've learned so much in leaning into that and realizing that there is something that God wants me to say and to share. And I know for many of us, we struggle with the fact that we feel like we're, we're inadequate and that we don't have much to offer. But I think those are the things we have to push through. Those are the things we have to deal with in terms of embracing who God has wired us to be and to go back to that first understanding that we laid out here, as Paul wanted us to see that we are God's workmanship, that we are his masterpiece. Now, we need to be reminded, too, that whenever God is going to call us, whenever he does engage us into ministry, that the evil one's going to do everything he can to frustrate us. He's going to try to stop us. One of the things that Satan does is he, the most basic way that he attacks us is he goes after our self-worth, our self-view, if you will, where he says, who do you think you are? It's that head trash, I call it. He will say, you're not ready. You're not worthy. You're not even good enough. So I want you to think about this because I think we need to see clearly that if God didn't want to use you, the evil one wouldn't be fighting so hard against us wouldn't be creating all this disconnect that's in our hearts and our heads. And the truth is, we may not have a lot of confidence in ourselves. That's a good place, actually. That's a good thing, because our confidence shouldn't be in ourselves. Our confidence should be in God. Now, it's interesting, the word confidence comes from the Latin word confide, where the word con means with, and fide, we've heard that before, right? Faith, confide which means having confidence or having faith. Now, it doesn't mean that you believe in you, but really what it does mean is that confidence is when we put our faith in what God says about you, right? Because we have Gideon who says, I am the least likely, Lord. But what Gideon was about to learn is that God often uses the least to do the most. So again, as we think about this, the kinds of people God uses, he uses the unlikely he uses the insecure, and he also, thirdly here, uses failures. Now, one of the most emotional stories in the Bible, we actually tapped on it on the end of the story last week when we talked about Peter when he met Jesus after the resurrection, but it was the first part of that story. You remember right after Jesus was arrested and he was taken before the high priest, it wasn't too long after that, Peter was actually there in the crowd. He sat down with some people by a fire, and a little girl pointed to him and said, hey, this guy was with Jesus. And how did Peter respond? Well, here in verse 60 of Luke chapter 22, Peter replied, man, I don't know what you're talking about. Just as he was speaking, the rooster crowed and the Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. And then Peter remembered the word of the Lord had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows today, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and he whipped bitterly. I don't know about you, but when we see those stories, just like Peter failed, I'm going to guess you've blown it big time. I know I have, if we're honest. There's been times in my life where I've embarrassed myself and others. I've felt ashamed and I've certainly felt unworthy. In fact, it was interesting, again, listening to the podcast from Lewis Howes, he talked about how his failures, as he's reframed them, the things that he's experienced, even as a football player, that his failures were simply a understanding of what he needed to do better. They were sort of an evaluation and when we think about life and we think about failures, I mean, the reality is it's those things that we sometimes let take us out. So it could be in these moments when we see failure, it could have been something that was public. It could have been when you lost your temper or maybe said something you shouldn't have said. It could be a financial decision that you've made. I know I've made a couple bad ones that have cost me dearly. It could be that you've struggled with telling the truth or maybe you've hurt someone who's close to you. Maybe you've battled addiction, or maybe you've been betrayed by a family member, or maybe you've hurt somebody that you love, or it could be even a private failure, right? It could be a secret addiction, something that you're struggling with, or maybe it's what you did or what you said or something that you didn't get caught for doing, and it can weigh on us daily. So here we have Peter who denied Jesus, and yet as we saw last week and we see here again, what did Jesus say to Peter after the resurrection, right? Did he say, you blew it, dude? Or did he say, I can't ever trust you, much less use you? No, that's not what he said. Jesus loved Peter and he forgave him. 
and he leaned in with Peter. The scriptures actually told us that Peter was, was hurt by what Jesus helped him see. But I think it was very powerful because what just happens uh, days later is that God uses Peter to preach at Pentecost as the coming of the Holy Spirit arrives. And he boldly proclaims what? Here in Acts chapter 2, verse 38 and 41, he says, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Wow, that's so amazing. You know, it's amazing in that story. You know, who better to preach about forgiveness than the one who was forgiven much, right? So I want us to see here, the scriptures are full of people with insecurities and with doubt and people who fail. And yet the reality is there aren't any other types around, right? I mean, the truth is we all have our excuses, but look at this list. Think about this. Jacob was a cheater, right? Father of Israel. Uh, Moses was a murderer. Uh, David had an affair and was also a murderer. Jonah ran from God and ended up in the belly of a whale. Elijah, we know he was depressed and wasn't quite sure what to do, even after God showed up in an amazing way. And we know Miriam was a gossip. We also know Martha. She was a worrier beyond measure. We know, too, as we've talked, Easter Sunday we talked about Thomas. He was a doubter. And then when we think about Paul, who as Saul killed so many Christians. Now, the reality, when you look at this list, all these people and many, many more, God used them all. So God wants to use you. In fact, I want you to see that there's so many new things, and that's why we took the group last week to visit, just to see what a church is doing in an incredible way, in a hard-pressed community, yet the beauty of the kingdom that comes in that understanding. Because the reality is, it's about us serving. Even this podcast that I listened to with Lewis, he talked about being great. And it, what, great wasn't the idea of success. In his mind, great was the idea of serving others. And so I want us to see that it is really important in this season that we think about how to serve God in a whole new way. Think about serving God through serving those that are around us that need to know the hope of the gospel. And maybe God's speaking to you now, and yet maybe you feel insecure, and maybe you feel like you really have nothing to offer, and maybe you feel like you've done something that keeps you from serving. Well, I just want to encourage you. The evil one's going to tell you that you're not worthy, and God will tell you that you are worthy, that because of what Christ has done for us, because of the power of the resurrection, what Jesus has accomplished on our behalf, you are, as a son and daughter, the righteousness of God, that you are an ambassador of the Most High, that you are God's workmanship, you are God's masterpiece. Paul reminds us that God has done the good work in you, that God has prepared that in advance for you to do. And so I want to encourage us in this season to stop doubting ourselves. And that to be reminded, too, is that when you do doubt, you are really doubting God. And we need to lean into the inheritance that he has for us because of what Christ has accomplished. So let me say it this way. You are not what you did. You are not what they did to you. You are not what they said about you. You are not what you think about yourself. The reality is in our doubts and in our insecurities, that's where God can meet us because then it's about our depending upon him. And to be reminded simply that God can and will use you if you're willing. And so let's put our faith in him. Let's in the midst of our uncertainties and in our insecurities of trusting that he has rescued us for a purpose, not to just save us from hell, but to equip us to be the hands and feet of Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we're grateful for just all the good things that you continue to do. Jesus, thank you for rescuing us and restoring us. And in this season, equip us to do all that you desire for your kingdom, to bring it now. In your most blessed name we pray. Amen. Let's continue our worship through song. The Father's song 
the Father's love. You sung it over me, and for eternity, it's written on my heart. Heaven's perfect melody, the Creator's symphony. Singing over me, the Father's song. Heaven's perfect mystery. The King of Love has sent for me. Now you're singing over me, the Father's song. Again, thanks for being with us this week. So glad you tuned in. I've got a link here in the worship notes to uh, the ministry we went and spent some time at if you'd like to know more about that. And to be reminded, as we say, that you've been blessed to be a blessing. So go forth and serve the world in Christ's name. Amen. Have a great week.